This is Broad Radio. For you, by you. Broad Radio. Here for more. Hello and welcome to Broad Radio. I'm Jo Stanley and my co-host today is comedian, fellow cat lover, Cal Wilson. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. So lovely to see you again. Oh, so nice to be here. You know, I was worried you wouldn't wear something bright and colourful because <laughs> we now have a black backdrop. But I, then I went, oh, I don't need to message Cal. She knows about bright and colourful. But then I've just got a black and white shirt today, so I've really <laughs> let myself down. But it does have cats on it. It does. So. And we love our cats. We have a beautiful show coming up for you. It's a little bit of fun, a little bit of rage today. Uh, the fourth edition of the She's Priceless report was recently re- released by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, which gives us a little snapshot into the gender pay gap in Australia, which uh, carries on a pace, really <laughs> seems not to change very much. So it's a bit rageful. And we're going to be joined by the CEO of Wajia, Mary Wooldridge, um, and to get a bit of an understanding of where we're at and what we can do about it, I mm. guess. Because I don't want to be a victim to this, right? No, no, you don't want to sit there and go, there's nothing I can do. You've got to be able to contribute to sorting it out. Yeah, that's right. Mm. We're not powerless, so we're going to find out what we can do about this uh, deeply troubling uh, part of gender inequality in Australia. Also, we're going to be joined by the glorious Julia Zamiro, who has just wrapped up Home Delivery, which is just the most beautiful series. And this one, the last one featured her. So we learned a lot about her, but we're going to learn more about Julia. You're going to be sharing a stage with her soon. I'm so excited. I feel like this is my little trailer, my teaser to Julia Zamiro to seeing her in the flesh tomorrow night. Mm. It's amazing. You're a busy woman, as is she. So we're very lucky to have both of you. Um, If you are joining us live on the socials, on Facebook or YouTube, it would be amazing if you commented or shared your questions or any thoughts along the way. We just love, I tell you, we have a gorgeous group of regular listeners and viewers um, and we're very grateful to you, but welcome to you if this is your first time as well. If you are catching up on this episode or any previous ones, you can do so by our podcast, Broad Radio On The Go, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, there's some amazing past episodes and really incredible people. I can't even tell you, like we punch way above our weight as far as the guests <laughs> we've had on this show. So um, do check out our back catalogue, as they say. Um, Kel, uh, I have to firstly ask you, because you are the host of The Moth. Yes. Right. And I'm fascinated in The Moth because it's true stories told live, mm-hmm. but it's not they're not stand up. It's not stand up comedy. No, no. So, so what it is that the, the moth has been a podcast for years and years now. And it started off. Uh, a guy was like, "We just need to get back to telling stories like we used to on the porch when the moths flew around the, the porch light." And so that's where the moth comes from. And so uh, I think it's twenty eight cities around the world this happens. Uh, Melbourne, I think London, and then all the rest are in the states. Maybe one in Sydney. But so what it is is you uh, you have a theme for the night and. You put your name in the hat if you want to tell a story and 10 names are drawn at random from the hat and then you come up and tell your story on a, on a theme. So, uh, for example, it might be like um, regret or lost love or or something like that. And then so you have all of these people get up and tell their stories. They're not professional storytellers or comedians, but magic happens every time. I've, I have never uh, cried so much as a host of any other show <laughs> of people get up and share incredible stories about themselves or experiences that they had and some of them are hilarious and some of them are heartbreaking and it's just 
such a beautiful feeling because everyone in the room recognizes that to give a true story to someone is a real gift it's a real mm. moment of connection and you know people are really nervous doing it and then they just come back and back and back and want to do it again because it's so exhilarating and as a comedian it's a real challenge for me because I tell a story each week as a comedian I'll tell a story and it'll be true-ish and then I will give a punchline that is oh the thing I wish I'd said or yeah, oh, yeah, totally. totally I mean let's be let's be completely honest as comedians you never let the truth get in the way of a good no, joke no, no, it's just it, it starts off it starts off as true and then yeah. it becomes this fantastical yeah. thing but with the moth my challenge is to tell something that's absolutely true mm. and I love that challenge myself yes. of going well I can't end it on that hilarious punchline I have to make the story what really happened I think I would quite like the freedom of not needing a punchline to be honest yes. <laughs> Take that pressure away from it. It doesn't need to be funny. It's just true. Yeah, it's just true. It's just true. So this upcoming one, which I believe is in August, beginning yes. of August. Next um, week, I think. The third? Yes, yes. The third, yes. I'm across your diary perhaps better oh, than you. So much better. Um, <laughs> the theme is happy, mm-hmm. right, which I – so I'm going to read the blurb because it really challenged me when I was reading this. A five-minute story about smiles and sunshine. Think unbridled joy. Landing the dream job, winning the talent show or bowling a perfect game, the quest for your soulmate or for the perfect cup of coffee, the Midas touch, the good old days, tales of finding happiness or letting it slip through your fingers, right? I find happy a really hard emotion to sort of even um, think is real Uh because the only part about that whole thing that actually I relate to is letting it slip through your fingers. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Have you? Do you, I mean? How often do people feel unbridled joy? It's moments, isn't it? It's usually moments. And so, so what I love about that theme is that you will get someone who will talk about, you know, being in Rome and it was a sunset and they had an ice cream with this wonderful person they'd met from the other side of the world, or you'll have someone telling a story about how the last time they were happy was before their mum died, or you know, like yeah. So, what I love is seeing how ten people come up with a completely ten completely different takes on one topic like yes it's, it's so um yeah it's uh, it, it's really lovely to see the way people's minds work or or how a tiny moment can be such a beautiful big story yeah well it's a slice of life yeah I suppose and if you're going to tell a story something ha- has to happen in it right mm. so there's got to mm. be an event and for myself I kind of look at I'm deeply envious of football teams or any kind of sporting team when you see that unbelievable joy like I'm a Collingwood supporter and on the weekend there was just this incredible euphoria when they won the game after the siren right that I've never felt like I just gotta go how do you get that but then I sort of go well maybe happiness you can tell it by comparison like in a way it's about the absence of makes Mm -hmm. you understand when you do have those fleeting moments yeah I guess yeah I mean do I sound really sad (laughs) <laughs> so if you were going to tell a story on the theme of happiness, what would you? how would you approach that? Well, because for me, I just think happy is a little false, maybe. Right. So I think, I think for, like my most content moments mm-hmm. and joyful moments, which to me is different, is like sitting in the sunshine, feeling that very mindful sort of peace <laughs> and the sense is alive with someone you love. But that's not a story. How would you tell a story about that? Oh, you could tell a story about how you've been through a tough time and then then at a moment you find yourself sitting in the sun contemplating that everything's okay you know like having got through something difficult or see now it needs a punchline (laughs) (laughs) I can't actually kind of understand what would you tell happy I tell I would what would I tell it could be anything it could be um like it could be the story of how the day after the comedy festival ended three years ago my son fell out of his bunk at seven o'clock in the morning and broke his arm Mm. and so we took him to the hospital and the the paediatric surgeon wasn't going to be there till that night so I had to put him in a temporary cast and uh, he had to stay there all day on, on pain medication. It was very upsetting. Then we uh, ended up having to stay the night and he, he kept on weeping whenever there was a TV commercial about food. Because, oh, poor little guy. Because he couldn't eat anything because he had to go, might have to have had to go under anaesthetic and everything. So he's lying in this hospital bed and there's like a KFC ad and he's going, they want me to die. They don't care about me. Like it's, and so for me, the moment of happiness was the next morning when we took him through the, a drive through oh. at McDonald's and he had a he had a bacon egg muffin and that like just that thing of like he'd been through this terrible twenty four hours of absolute hell and then it was like, I mean, what? This is not something we normally do, but mm. it's just like whatever you like, buddy. He'd been through a lot, and that seeing him like, 
in the back yeah. seat with his little cast on and that that is a quite literally an ad for McDonald's. Well yeah. done. You should sell that to her, whoever their agency is. But B, I I relate because food makes me very happy. Oh, <laughs> so how, I how good is it? And you know, you know it could be that, like, just that thing of like an amazing ice cream, like yes, yes. Any it could be any tiny moment. One of my favourite stories, which is not on the theme of happy at all, but I've never forgotten it, was about um, a guy who had been going through a difficult time. And he lived by himself and he ended up getting himself a dog. And so that was like a little chihuahua that just absolutely adored him and he absolutely adored the dog. And then he had to go away. And uh, when he came back, the dog had eaten his face out of a whole lot of photographs. Because <laughs> it was annoyed with him. <laughs> I, 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 like, it's, a <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story. And it... <laughs> It's a great story. And, and yeah, wow. I'd say I, I'm very, very fascinated by what makes a great story. And I'm going to go along to The Moth. Please I really do, would come. really, um, yeah, I would love it. Um, so the, yeah. the Facebook page is The Moth in Melbourne. Yeah. And sometimes they'll post, uh, they'll post like a, a story that's been recorded before. And there's some really, really beautiful mm. ones. But it's such a great community too. And, and people that come along and tell a story inevitably come back and tell another story. And yeah. it's so great to see people develop and mm. discover all of these things that they didn't know they could talk about. Yeah, I love I love when people find their voice. Mm. That is just, you know, because what a privilege we have always had mm. to have a microphone and an audience, big or small, mm. to have that voice is really, I consider the greatest privilege yeah. of my career. And so how wonderful to see, witness people find their voice. Yes. And also oh, as, as an audience, you know, if, you know, putting your name in the hat, but you've got a little audience slip that you answer a question. Like, so tell us about a time you were bitterly disappointed or something like mm. that. And then, then I can Where just... Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> See, the negative emotions I really relate to. I didn't know you were ill. <laughs> what about rage? What about rage? Have you done rage? I can't remember if we've done rage, but I, feel, I know that I'm going to feel rage very soon. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think you are. Um, and before we move on to rage, I need to acknowledge uh, the lovely good mornings we've had from Eche and also from uh, Katrina, who says, what about fundraising for Broad Radio? Joe, you must have had a very happy day to reach that goal. You're exactly right, Katrina, actually. That was a weeping with joy. Well, that still counts. Yeah, that was amazing. But then that was sort of tinged with a bit of... Um, feeling like I'm not worthy, which is a bit, Oh, and you a little know? bit of imposter syndrome. Yes, oh, well. when can we just be purely happy? Anyway, we're getting back to rage, okay? Because if you haven't felt rage, you are about to. Um, it's with our next guest. She is from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. She's the CEO of this extraordinary organisation who have released the fourth edition of their She's Priceless uh, report, which gives a snapshot into the gender pay gap in Australia. And it doesn't look good. As the saying goes, we will be travelling to other planets before women receive equal pay at this particular rate. She is, as I said, the CEO of Wujia, uh, Mary Woodridge, who must be an extremely even-tempered woman, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Morning, Jo. Morning, Cal. Would you say that you're an even-tempered woman to deal with the facts that are before you every day as far as the gender pay gap is concerned? You have to keep focused on the goal. Um, and I don't think, uh, you know, it's very concerning, the numbers, uh, and the fact that they persist at such a level. But um, people don't necessarily respond to being admonished and... Um, uh, you know, and yelled at. So we try and put it in a positive context about the opportunity for change um, and press really hard. So, you know, try and keep, keep that uh, um, positive, uh, forward-looking approach about the opportunities uh, rather than, um, you know, always being completely frustrated, which, of course, the numbers don't lie. The numbers do not lie, even though a lot of people would suggest they might. Um, there are three drivers you found in your most recent report to the gender pay gap. Can you very briefly explain what those three are? Well, it's fabulous research that we do with KPMG and the Diversity Council, which actually looks at the components of the gender pay gap, not just um, you know what the overall number is. And the big three drivers, about a third is discrimination. That's 
bias in recruitment, in promotion, in pay rises, those sorts of things, um, things that happen uh, you know, overtly and covertly around uh, workplaces. Uh, about a third is uh, the time that women take out of the workforce uh, to predominantly for family responsibilities, but other caring responsibilities as well. Um, and then about a quarter is contributed by the structures that we have. So our industrial structure and our occupational structure, which is the types of jobs that women predominantly work in um, and the types of roles that they have within those jobs, which tend to be lower paying on both counts. So uh, there's a lot to work on, um, but we know what the drivers are and therefore we need you know, plans, policies and programs to address them. So it seems like there is so much to address still. How do you start? Like, where do you start? Like, it feels like it's like having like six balls of wool all tangled up together. Like, which thread do you pull? Well, getting buy-in from corporate leaders in workplaces is absolutely fundamental to this. Um, and it only changes when you have that leadership from the executives and from the board uh, to drive it with an organisation because it doesn't happen um, just by osmosis. So um, convincing uh, people and, and helping uh, corporate leaders to be motivated for change is absolutely fundamental. And we do that because we know the evidence. The evidence is there that that companies that have better gender equality, more women and a more balanced leadership team, for example, uh, are more profitable. Um, mm -hmm. They're more productive. And if you're listed on the stock exchange, they actually have a higher value. So there's, a, there's an economic argument for it, as well as, of course, the social and moral argument that this is, you know, this is the right thing to do. We should be treating men and women equally in the workplace. So what are some, some success stories then? I'm sure that you see um, companies and leaders who really proactively address this. What have they done? Well, first of all, I've got to say, I'm loving that we're having a national debate about gender equality. The fact that it was an election issue is fantastic, means we're talking about it. Um, it's in the papers every day. Corporate leaders are seeing the opportunity to step up. Um, and we've also got a really tight labor market um, so you know women can be demanding in terms of uh, and, and choosy in terms of the roles they're taking and um, and what they want to see in a workplace uh, so that's all very positive context um, and companies are stepping up for that so there's lots of great examples we're seeing some transparency in gender pay gaps uh, some companies are voluntarily saying what their pay gaps are and how they're working to address it um, there is a commitment from the federal government that uh, more companies and the majority, especially large companies, will have their pay gaps reported publicly and uh, we think that'll be a real motivator for, for further change. Um, but it, it ranges across the board. It's about getting more women into senior positions. It's about making sure our boards are balanced. It's about making sure that parental leave is available um, and that men are taking it up as well as women. Mm. And that culture change aspect is really fundamental to this as well. Uh, it's about flexible work and I think the um, outcomes as a result of COVID have meant that uh, we can work more flexibly uh, and workplaces and especially senior leaders have, have learnt that people are very productive when they're working flexibly um, and that can, if implemented in the right way uh, and embedded for the future, can really benefit women as well to be able to juggle those responsibilities of family and caring uh, as well as work. It sort of seemed to me over COVID, I did a lot of online corporate work, and it seemed to me that um, there was sort of more humanity in interactions with corporations now, of like people being aware that, oh, yes, you are going to have to leave this meeting because you've got to sort your daughter out or something like that. It sort of felt like there was a suddenly people turned into people mm -hmm. in a way of yes. like just the acknowledgement that there is a life that has to happen outside work. And um, because we were all sort of in the same storm together, it just it felt like there was a... Shift, well, you know, and suddenly there was not that um, extraordinary divide between workplace and home yep. life, in a way. And that's good because people saw, you know, people's kids in the background of their <laughs> Zooms and, and uh, their pets and, and all the other responsibilities and things that they had. But it's also been a pressure and there's some evidence that's showing that, that um, because work is now 
you know, in your office or in your at your kitchen table, it's hard to, um, you know, extract yourself from it. And yep. and there is an increasing pressure to be working more. So that's why I say we've got to be really intentional about what flexible work looks like going forward and how companies, you know, we all we fell into it, um, we made it work, but now we've got to put structures around that to make sure that it does work and it's not just uh, more and greater demands and particularly if it's predominantly women who are working flexibly and men are returning to the office, that we don't go back to our old ways of presenteeism being really critical. And they're the ones, once again, that get the FaceTime, get the promotions, get the pay rises. Mm. Um, we've got to be intentional about managing flexible work in a way that works for men and women um, and doesn't disadvantage one. I'd like to see too, um, I mean, in, in a perfect world, just a complete innovation around how we see leadership. I recently met a woman who is very, very senior in a massive corporation. She is a job share, though, arrangement with another woman. And it was something they put to the board and the board were, mm, I don't know if we can, they just, you know, they couldn't kind of get their head around how would that work? Would we have to speak twice to two different people? And they're like, no, it's a job share arrangement. We will do the communicating between each other. And it works so beautifully, but it's the only time I've heard someone like, she is a wow. senior in that mm. role in that company as you can get. It's the first time I've seen that kind of level of leader job share. But why can't that work, Mary? Well, it needs to. And um, we released some data just a few weeks ago um, looking at uh, part-time work. Um, well, it was ages and ages and wages and, and broke our data up um, by the age uh, categories that showed that actually, fascinatingly, at no time are more than 50% of women working full-time. But of the managerial roles, over 90% of them are full-time positions. So we have this really fundamental disconnect between uh, women and, and the way they can or are able to work and in terms of um, only only less than half being able to work full-time, but the expectations of senior managers are full-time. We, we do need to fundamentally rethink what leadership roles look like. Why can't they be done job share? And, and you know, I've got a couple of examples of job share, but there's not many, but, but that's a great one that you've brought up. Um, but also part time. Why can't they be done part time and just structured and managed uh, accordingly? Um, so we need to think if we want to make sure we can get more women into senior executive positions, we need to rethink what those senior ex executive positions look like um, to enable women to be able to have those roles. Mm. Is there a, a lot to be said around um, transparency as far as what people are paid? Because I feel as though I've suffered in my career mm -hmm. based on this confidentiality around what people's workplace agreements are. Whereas, you know, at the time I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's getting paid a lot more than yep, me, yep. but I can't ask him, I can't tell him I can't ask my manager because of this confidentiality, which in the end means that, it, you know, the, the gap is just protected. So the evidence at the moment is divided about whether it reduces the gender pay gap in terms of reducing pay secrecy. But you've got to think that um, shining some light on these, um, you know, pay differences um, is only going to improve um, women's position to negotiate um, and you know and and a real assessment of fairness within an organization so um, you know we think it's you know a positive step in terms of pay secrecy interestingly the accounting firms under under quite a bit of pressure have the big ones have uh, started releasing information about bands salary bands and and who's in them so it starts to bring that transparency uh, and get around those confidentiality clauses and what the research also shows is that um, where you publish job ads with a salary band in the job ad you get more women applying and more women who are successful and better outcomes in terms of their their pay in terms of the negotiation because you've been open about what the expectations are and so you remove that question that you know all of us have had mm. is what were you paid in your last job um, and what that question does is it just cements the differences that we've experienced over the course of our career rather than saying we value this position and this role with this amount of money um, and you know we're not going to to you know take previous inequities into account in the process.
Mm. Is, is there an age group of women that's the most affected by the pay gap? Like, is it are things better for younger women because they're entering the job force now, or is it sort of just the same across all ages? Well, you know, the the sad news is is that every age has a pay gap. Uh, so even women and men graduating from undergraduate, there's a pay gap of about two and a half percent. And part of that is the, the roles women are choosing to take, um, once again, going into those lower paid industries overall. But that just increases year on year. And the big di- divergence happens um, in the early 30s, early to mid 30s, when women are leaving the workforce to have family, um, taking time out, um, and women never catch up. So in fact, the gender pay gap between 45 and 65 um, is the highest of, of all ages. It's over 30%. Um, and, you know, oh, basically hmm. when women leave the workforce, you never catch up ever again um, for, you know, on average. Um, and that's the disturbing truth. So I guess I, I, like you, Mary, want to try and find a positive way of moving forward with this because it is entirely rageful. Mm. Um, and so a part of me thinks, is it about... Um, trying to empower ourselves to ask for a better workplace agreement and actually back ourselves to ask for a better wage, which I, I think is perhaps simplistic and also I don't think all of us can do that. Not, not all of us have that kind of power and not all of us are in agreements that are negotiated. But what can we do? Like I feel I'm a bit at a loss and for myself, I haven't had the courage to ask for more in the past and I'm someone who you would think I should be able to do that. Well, one of the um, unknown gems that we have as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency is a database of every company with over 100 employees and their performance in relation to uh, workforce composition, uh, in terms of their policies such as parental leave, flexible work, um, and if they've done a pay gap audit and if they've taken any action. So I'd really encourage people to, first of all, be informed um, in terms of that information. You can go to our website and and find that out for a company that uh, that you may be even either thinking about working for um, or working for currently. And so, it does um, strengthen the capacity to ask the questions in the recruitment process or in your existing job, to talk to your manager, to talk to your HR manager and say, why haven't we done a pay gap audit? You know, why did we do one but took no action as a result? And start those conversations amongst your peers um, and and with your you know, senior manager. But I think it's not just that, and we can't rely, rely on employees to do it. Although, as I've said, with a tight labor market and people voting with their feet in terms of jobs and positions, um, I think the employee's position is strengthened as it hasn't been for a long time. Um, but we also need employers to be stepping up and, and, um, and taking that leadership role. Um, and some of that they do voluntarily because they see it actually as a, as a point of difference. They see it as a recruitment opportunity as well as, of course, the right thing to do and a good outcome for their business. Um, And from our perspective as a government agency, um, things like adding gender pay gap transparency and requiring that um, is a legislative requirement where we up the ante to say it's not good enough. Um, Companies need to step up on gender equality. um, And these are some of the pressures and and ways we can um, enforce that to happen. Because it's not enough to just sort of call out a bias and then say, oh, you know, the next generation of girls, there's going to be so many more engineers and there's going to be so many more women in, in STEM and because they'll go in there and potentially get paid less. So <laughs> that's not the answer, is it? No, it's not. And and um, while the gender pay gap has been coming down, the, the rate of change is glacial. It's it's so slow. It's going to take forever to, to address the gap. Um, and we need to speed up and accelerate the rate of change. And that's one of the things that we've, as an agency, um, changed our mission um, to being focused on accelerating that rate of change. How do we speed up um, uh, you know, the change that needs to happen um, by working with companies and employers um, to, to do that? And as you've said before, there are some companies doing great things and there's some great examples of, um, of how you can change one. I'll, I'll just give you one. One story, because you know, as we know, stories are um, uh, you know a good way to illustrate. But uh, Kimberly Clark and, and they don't you know they're very public about this. Um, had no women in their factory floor in one of their um, uh, factories in um, uh, you know a regional community. 
And they wanted to do something about it. They didn't know what to do. And so they had a look at their job ad and they saw that a requirement was a forklift driver's license. And they thought, well, we can teach that on the job. We don't need to have that as a requirement of the application. They removed that and the next year they had 40% of applicants were women. And so, you know, that's not a hard thing to do. That's actually just having uh, an intent to do something, being thoughtful about what to change. And and now they're recruiting 50-50, you know, in an ongoing way and they've, you know, done a whole lot of other things to make sure that women can be successful in those roles. But this isn't, doesn't have to be um, major and significant. It can just be small changes that are inhibiting people putting their hand up um, and having those opportunities. And of course, we know that it's people coming through